I'm so, sorry, the band is a little unruly. <laughs> I'm technically responsible for them, but not today, so get it together. Um, just kidding. Good morning, everybody. My name is Grace Young, and I'm the music director here at Atlee Church, and I have the privilege and the honor and the pleasure of being with you this morning, sharing my heart on this section of the book of life as we've been going through. Um, we have been reading through this book. If this is your first week here, uh, just going to get you up to speed real quick. We've been reading th through this book, Life Is, by Judah Smith, and today I'm actually, I get to talk to you about having inner peace. This is a pretty good weekend, I think, to talk about having inner peace because we have these big uh, celebrations that our country is about to do tomorrow. And I think a lot of people, no matter where you're at in your mind space, um, I think a lot of people are kind of wrestling with how to respond or how to have peace amidst all these differing opinions and all these things going on. So I hope today will be helpful for us. Um, I know that, you know, like Christians say, be careful what you pray for. When Trey gave me this topic to speak on, I was like, oh, no problem. Inner peace is like my jam. I love inner peace. I love to keep things calm. But then as I began to work on the message, God was like, all right, now I wanna show you this. Now I wanna show you this. Now I wanna challenge you in this way. And it has been a crazy few weeks. For me, I've had a lot of opportunities and temptations um, to be able to not have inner peace. And so I feel like God has shown me something really cool, and I'm so excited to share it with you. Over the last few weeks, I have uh, had a number of things. I'm just going to share with you what's been going on in my life. I had to first set a very difficult emotional boundary with a loved one um, that had been definitely depriving me of inner peace for a long time, and so that was very difficult. We had a tragic death in our family, and I had to spend time with my father while he was in the intensive care unit in West Virginia two weeks ago. Um, and then I left my book for the series in West Virginia at the hospital, and I was like, how am I going to write my message? But it's all right. I, I got another one. <laughs> um, I found out actually a young, otherwise healthy but estranged friend of mine has colon cancer, which was a very difficult situation to navigate for me. Uh, and then my oldest daughter turned 12, which is crazy, 12 year old, oh my gosh. I planned a birthday party for my daughter, which usually really stresses me out, like putting on events. I love it when it's done, when it's happening, I love it. But the process of getting there is incredibly difficult for me and brings a lot of discomfort and a lot of opportunity to not have inner peace. Um, I'm still staring at my schedule for the next six weeks thinking like, okay, when, when are my rest days? When is my time where I'm really gonna make sure that I'm taking time to focus on inner peace because things are busy this summer. There's not much wiggle room. So if there is ever a time I could have lost my inner peace, and I probably did a little bit if you ask my husband, uh, it would have been the last few weeks. Plus, worst of all, I didn't really hear, feel like I was necessarily hearing from God in this time period. And I've always relied heavily on the feeling of God's presence in my life and the Holy Spirit just kind of speaking to me or just fe being able to feel it all around me. Um, but over the past year, something's been shifting in my life, in my uh, faith maturity maybe is what you could say, that I can feel I'm being challenged to mature. I'm being challenged to go deeper. I'm being challenged to rely on my faith instead of my feelings. Uh, instead of being spoon-fed his presence, like I felt was so common in the first like decade of following Jesus, I have to get serious about my disciplines of seeking him and inviting him to lead me and waiting on him and just meditating on him, who I know he is, who I, what I know he's done for me, what I know he's done for other people that I know and love, um, and also the things that are in the Bible, what I've seen, what I've read, I know that it's true. And now is a time in my life where I'm digging in and I'm just standing firm, even if I feel like, you know, I'm, at some points I feel like I'm alone. So this has been a really interesting time. Um, David, in the Bible, he wrote, he was a kind of like me or whatever, he was like a music director, he was also the king, but he was really into music and poetry. And I'm, I'm not saying anything. <laughs> um, anyway, he wrote a lot about like, God, I don't feel you right now. But then he would always come back to, he would list all the things God's done for him, all the things he's thankful for, all the things he sees every day with his own eyes to confirm that he knows that God is there. 
And so the Psalms have been my jam all year long. I have really been enjoying them more than I ever did um, when I was probably a younger follower in Christ. There's a season in our seeking and in our journey for questioning and for proving and for learning who God is. And then there's a season for just standing firm. And a lot of people unfortunately never get to that season. They wanna question endlessly and they never really find their footing in Jesus as a steady, faithful companion. And it's been a really great tragedy for me to see personally. I've seen a lot of people and a lot of friends refuse the next phase of the process of maturing in Christ and refuse to put in the real work to discover what he has next for them, simply because it's not as easy as a spontaneous feeling. So at first, I thought I was gonna write about all these wonderful things I've learned in my life. And then over these last few weeks, I've realized that I think there's one specific thing that God really, really wants me to share. It's the, the something he's been actually showing me over the last few weeks. And I think we really need to urgently know it and grasp onto it right now as a church and as a community. When you think of inner peace, what comes to mind? Just think about it for a moment. Maybe write it down or just kind of keep that question in your mind today. When I think of inner peace, I think of this thing called the Enneagram test. If you know, you know, but if you don't, I will explain it a little bit. Um, so it's been around for about 50 years. It's like a personality test that helps you kind of figure out what your baseline is in your personality and then helps you to overcome some of the weaknesses you might have, some of the things you might be regularly, uh, I would say like coping mechanisms that you might regularly go to when you're having a tough time. The test has gotten really, really popular in the last five years or so. So I know some of you really are gonna understand what I'm about to say next. Some of you, it's okay, but I'm a nine on the Enneagram, which means I'm a peacemaker. Um, there, we have a big reputation for hating conflict and for trying to like keep everybody calm around us. Uh, but I would say the easiest way to describe my personality is that my natural state is to keep my inner sea as calm as possible, no ripples. Like ripples are so uncomfortable. Stress, big feelings, conflict, all of those things cause ripples, waves, you know, maybe even like a tsunami. <laughs> and I wanna make them stop as soon as possible. And to do this, over the last 15 years or so, I've read so much and worked so hard to learn how to keep my tumultuous inner sea calm when unexpected troubles happen. Thankfully, there are a ton of resources online. All you have to do is actually Google uh, how to maintain inner peace and you'll get like a million articles and resources and it's horrendously overwhelming. So it is not the way to get inner peace, I promise. I've done it a hundred times. Um, but if I were to suggest two resources other than the Bible that I think are really good for uh, cultivating inner peace and learning how to increase your inner peace, I would suggest books like these. I've, I've gotten a lot out of these. Um, 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do. That's actually a really good book. Um, and then Making Peace with Imperfection, which is really great. We tend to be perfectionists, and this one shows us all the different ways that we tend to try to make things perfect. But these books have never really done what for me what Jesus has done for me. In Life Is, the book we have been going through as a church, Judah Smith shares the concept of shalom that we find in the Bible. And last week, Trey talked about shalom. He spoke about the value of it, and it's a, it's a Hebrew word for being a specific kind of peace. It's like a holistic, whole ball of wax kind of peace. It's really the kind of peace God wants for us to have. When we feel like we're not at peace, what do we do? We often go to Google, or read books or watch YouTube videos to try to you know, stir up our inner peace a little bit, get some motivation. Or we try hard to just push it away, to just ignore it. But there comes a time when we just get tired of that battle. I've learned the hard way that my strength is downright pitiful at keeping myself at peace for very long. 
At this point, it's easy to be tempted to give in. This is who I am, right? Like just messed up, never gonna change, I'm imperfect. Well, sort of. In Life is, Judas Smith talks about letting God do the work of peace within us and how we should seek him and then peace will follow. Specifically on page 137, he writes, if we keep God first in all our relationships, our anxieties and our struggles, our fear and stress levels drop. And when we let Jesus do the worrying and the heavy lifting, we're free to evaluate, prioritize, and maneuver through life. So I was thinking a lot about this quote after I read it. I know these words are true, but I'm also a really straightforward person. Like I, wanna, I want you to just tell me, all right, do this and I will do it. I will run towards it. I will, you know, but abstract kind of things like this are actually really hard for me to put into practice. And so I'm thinking and praying about this. I was praying, God, like, what does this look like for me? How do I do this better? Because I don't always do a great job at that. I wanted God to show me just what can I do now to not just get through tough times, but to stay awake to what God actually has for me in this moment or what he's asking me to do in this moment. The New Testament which is written about the time period that Jesus was alive and then follows his first followers as they're trying to spread the good news, goes on to say that God is referred to as the God of peace. It's in there five times. And in a letter to the people of ancient Ephesus, Paul, an early follower of Jesus, reminds his friends that he himself is our peace, talking about Jesus. Jesus is our peace. If we turn back to what Trey referred to last week as that like great big locker room speech before Jesus ascends back into heaven, in that speech, Jesus told his followers, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And this is not the only time that Jesus says something like this, actually. He, he repeats this multiple times. And in, conjunc in conjunction, actually, with many references to staying awake, staying alert, don't fall asleep, don't doze off, stay in the game. After a few days of thinking through all of this and just praying about it, an image popped into my head. It was the image of my inner sea being completely placid, but kind of like being in a bubble. There was a tumultuous storm raging all around and waves kind of crashing up against the bubble all around me. Inside my calm space was just me and Jesus and no one else, nothing else. The argument I just had with my daughter or my husband outside the bubble the frustration with an unexpected bill that just came in the mail, outside the bubble. Even my own fears, my own anxieties, and my own thoughts were outside of this bubble. Everything was in its right, right place, and Jesus was before it all, there with my soul. All of a sudden, I felt this incredible confirmation of total peace, that kind of shalom that Trey was talking about. As I experienced more and more of those challenges that I mentioned earlier, I would forget and start to feel like riled up. And then I would gently bring myself back and try to go back into that space with Jesus before my reactions, before everything going on around me. And the difference made such a, well, it made a huge difference. When I remember to do this, it's remarkable, game-changing. I'm not hiding from it. I'm actually still in the chaos, but the difference was is that the chaos was not within me. I'm able to respond much more thoughtfully, to process what I'm seeing and feeling, and my energy felt much more conserved and wisely spent. For years, in prayer and meditation, I've envisioned my inner sea with just me in it, and it seemed impossible to keep the waves from coming by myself. But I think this is really what all of those scriptures mean 
when they're talking about putting everything, giving it to Jesus and putting everything, bef- putting him before everything. Finally, I had a visual that I could kind of hold on to in those moments. It reminded me of the Hebrew phrase, Shabbat Shalom. This is kind of an expansion of what Trey talked about last week. I grew up keeping a very strict 24 hour Sabbath with my family and we would always greet each other with Shabbat Shalom. We even had a song that we would sing with literally just the word Shabbat Shalom. And it means something like have a peaceful rest or have a completely fulfilling and rejuvenating rest. The term and the practice, which was a weekly ritual, actually forces people to go from doing to simply being in God's presence and just resting in his peace. The Sabbath is a day every week when we're forbidden to be Martha, like Trey talked about last week. If you haven't seen it, definitely go back and watch our, go on our YouTube channel, watch that message, because he talks about Martha and Mary. It forces us to get in touch with our inner Mary and just sit with Jesus and stop doing and striving to just receive instead of trying to constantly earn and push. We often get so used to this chaos being so close to us and inside of us that we think that's who we are. And I think that's the real tragedy of of all of this. Jesus comes along at some point and says something that terrified me personally, and maybe you've experienced this too. He says, that's not who you are. And we're like, well, I don't know who I am other than this, because this is all I've ever known. Like, this is the only me I remember. In a conversation with our small group last week, this topic came up. And we talked about it for a while. I personally know that this kind of inner work to leave behind our old dysfunction and to try to really swallow our pride so that we can heal and bring healing to our families. This is hard work. The fearful thought in the process is, will there be anything left when I leave this part of me behind? When we make an unhealthy decision enough, it begins to be just become a part of how we act and how we think. If we're not careful, it becomes a part of our identity without us even realizing it. It's that bad habit, that bad attitude, that know-it-all pride we carry around. It's the dynamic of gossip between us and our friends, our negativity and thinking, the tendency to judge others so quickly when we have no idea what they just experienced in their life now or things that are still affecting them from their past. It's the anger and the selfishness and the addiction we've had for as long as we can remember. God never intended for those things to be a part of us, but we've got to get in the game and take a proactive role in our lives because he can, he can separate us from those things. He knows the real us. And this was hard for me to understand for a while until I actually felt the truth of it in my journey. He knows the real us and he's gonna bring it back to the surface and remind us who we are and teach us who we are and reveal to us who he designed us to be. And I promise it is way better than all the things we've been putting up with our whole lives. They exhaust us. The more time we spend with Jesus in a safe space like the one I've been meditating on and thinking about and talking about today, the more we get to know who we are on the purest level. And it's a beautiful thing. I haven't found any other way to calm the ripples than to sit with Jesus in that space. This is what it means to let him shoulder our anxieties, our fears and our flaws or whatever it is. He's with us on this side of imperfection, providing a shield and a protective haven between us and all else. A lot of us question God when something tragic or difficult happens in life, it feels very natural to do it. It is unthinkable, the things we hear about or experience. How could this good God of peace let this happen? Is a question I hear all the time. As I was driving back from West Virginia last week, I was alone and it was about three in the morning and an animal ran in front of my car 
and I safely swerved and hit it, or missed it, I mean, sorry. <laughs> I safely hit that thing. No, I, thankfully, I swerved and I missed it. But this idea came into my mind that the free will of humanity on earth is like the animals that make the wrong choice to run out in front of a car. I even, twice, I've had one animal push another animal into my car. So sometimes it's not even that animal's choice. It's just something that happens to them. Uh, one of them survived, my dog, amazingly. Actually, I think the other deer survived as well. So it, nobody died, just to let you know. But in this analogy that I'm gonna share with you right now, God is the road. He's got a whole lot of routes that keep bringing us back to the way home. We have to follow the road. When we hit an animal, we are distraught and often disturbed by it, but we don't start to question the existence of the road. <laughs> we get mad at the animal for running out in front of us, or maybe we get mad at ourselves for driving so fast, for not paying attention, or for texting while we were driving. But we get back on the road if our car is still drivable and we follow the road home. We don't swear off roads altogether. Now, I know that there's like a big contingency of off-roaders in here, so just suppress that inner like disagreement you've got with me right now. <laughs> we get back on the road, that's the point. So why do we act this way then towards God? God has been just as real to me in my life as any asphalt road I've ever driven on. I trust him and I know he's here. He's there with me in all those situations. So then how do we follow Jesus? Like I said, I'm a practical person and it probably sounds like I'm actually really giving abstract advice, but for me, I, visualizations are really helpful for me. So I hope it is helpful for you. But first to follow Jesus, we have to drive on the road that's been paved for us and provided for us. And that is to join ourselves to Jesus and to follow God's teachings for our lives. Jesus actually even called his early followers the way. They like had a road name basically as, as their name. And that's what they were referred to in their culture. Then we have to stay on the road, stay awake, drive carefully and pay attention Look out for others. Don't drive in a way that's gonna put others at risk. We have to stop and help people in need when we see them. We also have to follow the signs, not like here's your sign, but guiding signs, the things that we see every once in a while when we're driving down the road. You're not gonna get one every inch of your drive, but when you do see a sign directing you on your journey and telling you how fast to go, what to watch out for, or what might be coming around the next corner, remember it and keep it in your mind. Lack of peace is when we choose to make our own road and choose our own way and our own reasoning, our own thoughts, instead of inviting Jesus into that inner sea with us to help us out and help us sort through all that's coming at us. In the Bible, God tells us to have peace by being still and knowing, holding on to knowing that he is God. He says, be still and know that I am God. A German theologian who I've learned a lot from over the years, he's, he's passed away, but I've read a lot of his books. He wrote a book called Innenland in German. Um, or inner, inner land. And it was funny because this came back up into my mind after I was already thinking about the inner sea thing and I was like, oh my gosh, this is that book. Like, I, I can't believe it kind of came full circle for me. And in Proverbs, the book of the Bible with all kinds of helpful short sayings and little piece of pieces of advice, it says, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. So what's the thought life of your heart or your inner land like? That's a question I have to ask myself all the time right now. When we are not at peace, we tend to resort to all these different coping mechanisms. Coping is pretty much never a good thing, but we justify it, you know, we're like, ah, I'm just gonna eat some ice cream because I don't feel so good right now. Um, too bad I'm allergic to ice cream, so it makes me feel worse. Um, but. Coping 
is like choosing to take a coping mechanism is like getting yourself out of your driver's seat of your car while it's moving and getting in the passenger seat and letting something else drive. And it's not taking an active role in your life. It's actually taking a passive role in your own life. And there's no way to be at peace when there's no one driving the car you're in. Thankfully, I've never experienced that before, but I'm pretty sure it would be terrifying. We've all probably heard the phrase, Jesus, take the wheel. But that doesn't mean you're in the passenger seat. It means that he's sending in reinforcements to help you. He's guiding you. He's, ex he's helping you tell you where to go, what to do, how to respond. When you realize that you're off course, which we all will be at, at one time or another, it's important that we just observe that situation with Jesus and identify where we made the wrong turn and adjust our course. Since Jesus' voice has to be louder than our own in this process, we are not going to be ruled by self-doubt, self-shaming, or guilt. You wanna know why this guilt and shame cycle is broken when we follow Jesus? Sometimes we use words up, up on the stage like repentance, and that can sound like we call it Christianese. It's like, what the heck does that word mean? I never hear that in my everyday life except for in church. But repentance is really just taking that mistake that you wanna make right and trading it with God for forgiveness and for freedom. That doesn't mean that there's no consequences. Certainly you still have to work out in life the people that maybe you affected by making that mistake. You're still gonna have to make some serious amends there. But you don't have to be stuck in the cycle of guilt and shame. The trade is once and done, and you are separated forever from those mistakes. Your soul is separated, and it makes a difference on a soul level. It's actually, there's a lot of scriptures. I was going to pull some scriptures about this um, from the Bible, but there are a lot. Like, you, you take my sin from me. You make it as far from me as the ends of the earth. It's all through the book of Psalms. It's in the prophets. It's all over the Bible. All things work together for good. We see this in the book of Romans, another book that Paul wrote, chapter 8, verse 28. All things work together for good. I was thinking about this a lot because those things could be terrible things. The things that happen by nature, the things that happen just because we live on the earth in this era and in this age, and it's imperfect. All of those things will still be in the recipe for a good outcome. You know, do you, know, you guys know what compost and fertilizer is made from? <laughs> probably, you probably do. It's dead and decaying plants, animals, fecal matter. It's all kinds of disgusting stuff that you don't wanna go near. And it's what plants and soil needs to thrive. It's the basis of life on earth. So I am like, all my ancestors were farmers pretty much. So I'm a little bit obsessed with like building soil. I'm like, you know, we bought a house in, a, in an HOA. You know, it's like a real small sort of little plot. And I'm like, what's the soil like here, you know? Um, and it's sandy around here. So we started a compost pile immediately. It's like a quarter of our backyard. It's huge. And uh, thankfully it doesn't smell too bad, but it is creating some incredible, incredible dirt and fertilizer from decay that we're gonna put on our yard and it's gonna create awesome life in another year or two. Jesus is not surprised by our mistakes and our decay. He knows what we're gonna do before we do it. He lets us do it too. That's what free will is. He knows how to get through to us Eventually, he will get through to all of us, and he knows how to bring us back to him. He's going to bring life out of the inevitable decay that we all produce in life. It's what he does. So uh, you might be wondering maybe where, why I wore this t-shirt today. I typically do not wear shirts with like logos or, or movie references on them on stage. This is Back to the Future. Um, me and my kids have been watching this a lot lately. We've been really enjoying these older movies. And I had this thought, I had to get, I had to get the t-shirt, because I was like, I gotta remember this one. 
um, that Jesus sees our present and he goes back to the future to prepare the way for good things to come about as a result of our mistakes. He's always doing these like recon missions for us and we will only understand the full depth of all the things he did for us after we move on from this life and enter the next. He already knows that dumb thing that you're gonna do tonight or tomorrow, and he has already made a way for you to come back away from that and walk back towards him and be embraced by him. He's at the beginning of things and he's at the end of things, and he knows how to bring each of us individually and uniquely back into his arms back into eternity despite our weaknesses and imperfections. He knows the pain you're about to go through that you don't even know about yet. And he's altering things around you so you can keep going through that season. Instead of trying to make the discomfort of life or your lack of inner peace go away by coping or instead of trying to do it all yourself, try this out, try to sit with Jesus in your calm inner sea, if you can be like as like heady as, as I tend to be, um, put all else out of your head and just take a deep breath, be still and know that he is God. This is how we keep our hearts from being troubled. This is how we keep our hearts from being afraid. The only thing in this bubble with my soul is Jesus' Holy Spirit. He promised us right before he went back to heaven that he would send us a helper, that he would send us his Holy Spirit to be with us and to guide us while we lived on earth. He's the only one that I need to allow into that space so deeply inside of my head, so deeply close to my soul. No voices or opinions or world events or anxieties or fears or stresses should be allowed to inform me deeply anymore. I shouldn't allow that stuff in so that it can't rattle my inner sea. This is something that I've just learned over the last few weeks. I am going to commit myself to this. And I know it takes daily renewal to maintain that practice. But just like in Judah's book that we're reading right now, he writes, if Jesus is inside you, if grace has transformed you or is transforming you, you are a force to be reckoned with. You no longer have to live under the rule of guilt, fear, and condemnation. So how do you deal with a lack of inner peace? What sort of coping mechanisms do you tend to run to? Or does, do you go to God and just be still, knowing that he is the king of souls? With Jesus by our side, you and I can have inner peace. And the cool thing is, is that we are now carriers of peace. We are free to take the power of good and the power of grace and mercy and compassion and the power of Jesus to people all around us who desperately need it. Jesus is our peace and he's saying, you don't have to carry the burdens anymore. So today, I'm gonna to finish the message in kind of a different way. Um, there's, this, there's a thing called a blessing, and they're pretty common in the Bible. It was a way uh, in ancient Israel for people to speak life over each other, to speak truth over each other, to encourage each other. Instead of all these negative things being thrown at you all day, sometimes we just need something good spoken over us. And so I'm gonna to end today with two different blessings or like spiritual affirmations. One of them is from the Bible and one of them is actually from my past. Um, my dad used to take me and my siblings to the synagogue every week for Sabbath. And one of my favorite Hebrew prayers I learned is called Sim Shalom. I'm gonna read this over each one of you today in both Hebrew and English. This is a prayer. Sim Shalom, Tova Uvracha, Chen Vachesed, Ve Rachamim, Alenu Ve Alchol, Amecha, Barchenu Avinu, Kulanu Ke Echad, Beor Panecha. Grant peace to the world, goodness and blessing, grace, kindness and compassion for us 
and for all of your people, God. Bless us, our Father, all of us as one, with the light of your presence. And then in Romans we read, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Would you bow your heads? We're gonna pray real quick. God, I thank you for this time. We're able to be together this morning to talk about inner peace, to try to speak words of life in a time when we hear so many words of decay and so many words of condemnation and slander. I pray that we can be a people that holds on to your goodness and who can see through all the weeds that are growing around us in our culture and in our world. I pray that we can make a difference. I pray that we can be light the way that you desire us to be. I pray that we understand fully who we are in you, that you reveal to each of us the truth of your word and that you bring about within us and around us that kind of peace, that kind of shalom you've been wanting for us all along. And I pray that we don't even stop there, that we take it and we try to bless someone else with it. We take it and we try to make a difference in the world around us with that kind of peace. And we thank you for this time together. And we give you all the praise and we give you all of our joy. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So every week, we leave you all with a few questions um, to just process about, process the topic over the next week or so. So today, I I wrote down a few just to help get the ball rolling a little bit more after church today for you guys. Um, You can maybe take a picture with your cell phone or look it up. It's on our app on the notes section of today's message. When you think of inner peace, what do you think of? How can you put God first in your life so you don't have to carry so many burdens? What does that look like for you? Where are you in your faith journey right now? Are you hooked on a feeling? Sorry, I know that's super cheesy, but I was like, I like that. Are you hooked on a feeling or are you just standing firm in faith? Are you somewhere in between? I would love to talk with you. If if anybody wants to talk after church, I'll be up here for a little while. Um, But I just thank you so much for being here. And I hope you guys really do have a wonderful weekend. Um, Hopefully you enjoy your day off tomorrow. Hopefully you have a day off tomorrow. I'm sorry if you don't, but (laughs) drive safely, guys, and have a wonderful week. I'll see you later.